University Malaysia Kelantan UMK is an entrepreneurial university. We implement the government's aspiration to ensure the younger generations are not only highly educated but also entrepreneurial. UMK is the number one entrepreneurial university in Malaysia and aspires to be one of the world's best by 2030. This is in line with the National Entrepreneurship Policy which aims to make Malaysia an entrepreneurial country by 2030. According to this vision, UMK ensures the whole university functions within an entrepreneurial ecosystem. This ecosystem comprises of nine faculties supported by institutes and centers of excellence implemented with the discipline of innovation-based entrepreneurship. The university's upper management together with UMK employees at all levels, are committed to realising UMK as a Malaysian public university well respected for its foundation of entrepreneurship. Implementing this ecosystem, the UMK Entrepreneurship Institute UMKEI oversees three other entrepreneurship-based centres, the Centre for Entrepreneurship Development and Education CEED, the Institute of Small and Medium Enterprises, ISMI, and the Global Entrepreneurship Research and Innovation Centre, GERIC. The Faculty of Entrepreneurship and Business, spearheading this structure, has successfully developed collaborative entrepreneurial networks such as UMK Frontier Street, Entrepreneurship Advisory Council, and proudly led the Committee for Ministry of Higher Education Guide to Entrepreneurship Integrated Education. From the academic aspect, UMK offers 29 undergraduate programs and 16 postgraduate programs in the fields of business and management, tourism and hospitality, science and technology, as well as arts and heritage. The university is constantly enhancing its teaching and learning system to ensure that the process of learning takes place creatively and innovatively through My Academic Integrated System, My Eyes, massive open online courses, MOOCs, and blended learning. UMK is committed to the development of first class graduates to become the leaders of industry. Collaboration with world-class local corporate sectors as well as a network of well-known regional educational institutions is aimed at empowering UMK from various angles. This is evidenced by the increase in the marketability of graduates and graduates who create jobs through businesses. Research, innovation and commercialization is another important part of UMK. Research funding and the number of innovations and commercialized products increase every year. UMK has performed well in various prestigious competitions. With the hashtag UMK for Society, UMK is also involved in various community activities. Our staff and students consistently demonstrate outstanding skills and abilities. With such a great spirit of teamwork, UMK has never looked back to emerge as a respected educational entity in the region. We at UMK believe that our presence will give a new look to the development of the value of knowledge. Indeed, our core entrepreneurship will always make us University Malaysia Kelantan relevant, unique and different.
Assalamualaikum. Good evening to participants joining from Malaysia and good morning to those of you joining us today from the United Kingdom. My name is Dr. Azahar Abu Hassan Shaari and I would like to start by thanking you for joining the 2021 Permikir Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series. Permikir have had the opportunity to, to collaborate with the UMK Islamic Center to organize today's Leaders Lecture Series. It is our privilege and pleasure to welcome you today. Before we start, allow me to provide a brief introduction to Permikir. Permikir is a Malay word that translates to thinkers. It is a new initiative established by the Faculty of Language Studies and Human Development from the University of Malaysia, Kelantan. The primary goal of Permikir is to promote global peace and human well-being by actively engaging in meaningful discussions with global scholars and leaders. Through the Distinguished, Le Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series, local and international scholars are invited to share their expertise, experience, and leadership for the promotion of global justice. In today's session, we have the opportunity to learn more about the latest developments in Islamic education, which aims to promote awareness of the injustice faced by Muslim communities, in particular among Uyghur and other Muslim Turkic groups. It is an honor to introduce you to our speaker today, Mr. Samir Widametwali. Samir Widametwali is a quantitative social scientist. His PhD in Advanced Quantitative Methods, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, examined the religious and ethnic penalties experienced by Muslims in the British labour market. Alongside his doctoral studies at the University of Bristol in UK, he pursues Islamic studies and has previously completed a one-year diploma in Islamic study with I syllabus. Samir is also an associate teacher at the University of Bristol and a Cumberland Lodge Fellow. Samir holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Brunel University and Master of Political Theory and a Master of Science in Comparative Social Policy from the University of Oxford, where he studied on a full scholarship from the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies. Mr. Samir, it is a great honour to have you with us today. Okay, for today's presentation, we will begin with a presentation from Mr. Samir. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a brief 20-minute Q&A session during which time we encourage you to ask a question that you have in the Facebook comment section. And before Mr. Samir begin his presentation, however, I would like to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Nur Azuki Yusuf, a director for Permikir, to say a few words. It is a pleasure to hand over to you, Dr. Azuki. Okay, thank you, Dr. Azaha. Assalamualaikum and greetings, everyone. We are delighted to have you joining us and participating in this special collaboration between Pomike and the UMK Islamic Center in Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series. We are very proud to be able to virtually host this session today from the Faculty of Language Study and Human Development, University of Michigan, Kelantan. Firstly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the director of the UMK Islamic Center, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Zain Mubarak, and Deputy Director Dr. Asma Laili, and their team for their support of this program. Of course, I also would like to offer a special welcome to our presenter today, Mr. Same Weda Metwali, who is joining us from the University of Bristol, United Kingdom. As Dr. Azha said, Mr. Same is a phenomenal quantitative scholar and an associate teacher at Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Citizenship, University of Bristol. He is also a PhD candidate and Cumberland Lord Fellow. And uh, now he will be sharing his expertise, experience, and leadership on the topic of spending ethically for justice, a Muslim response to the Uyghur genocide. Okay, before I hand over to Mr. Sameh, 
I want to reiterate on behalf of the PEMIK and the UMK Islamic Center, a warm welcome. And it's wonderful to have so many of you here. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. to all the emails. Thank you, of course, to the graphics team and the technical team at the University of Malaysia, Kelantan. And thank you for this opportunity to the organizers for such a necessary platform. It's a privilege and an honor to contribute to this collaboration, particularly on such an urgent topic. So thank you to the university, the faculty, the students, the administrators, and of course, all the attendees. As mentioned, the talk will last for approximately an hour and there'll be 20 minutes of Q&A at the end. That said, if you have any problems understanding me or if I speak too fast, or if you can't hear at any point, please just ask. The presentation is a two-way exchange. It's for you to understand and get something. And it's for me to learn from your comments and perhaps even your disagreements so I can develop my idea further. So while we have a Q&A at the end, if there is something you feel you are stuck on or don't understand or is making it difficult for you to follow, please do ask and interrupt. The aim is for you to take something away and to pass that on and to share that knowledge with others and inshallah for all of us to make behavioral transformations to enable better positive social change. So today I'm presenting my paper that was published by Yaqeen Institute for Islamic research. But before I begin, some important disclaimers are in order. First, the artwork is copyright of Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. Second, I am not employed, I do not represent, nor speak on behalf of Yaqeen or any of its affiliates, nor am I associated with the organization. Third, I am the sole author of this paper and the views, opinions, findings, and conclusions expressed therein are strictly my own. The final disclaimer. Islamic scholarship is one that is rooted in a tradition where people speak on a topic after rigorous and robust training and education to avoid unsubstantiated claims to wisdom and knowledge, particularly those of a theological nature. It is in that spirit and in reverence of that tradition among Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah that I approach this topic. In particular, the second half of this paper has theological underpinnings and advances ideas and concepts of justice in Islam and its associated obligations. It was peer reviewed by sheikhs and scholars who know much more than me. While I myself have undertaken some basic Islamic studies, I am not an Islamic scholar. And I would not present this research had it not been checked and approved to be in line with Sunni orthodoxy by Islamic scholars. With that, let us begin. I will switch off my camera so the slides can occupy the main screen, but I will switch it on right at the end for the Q&A. This paper is entitled Spending Ethically for Justice a Muslim response to the Origoi genocide. And it's focused on highlighting the situation in occupied East Turkestan, explaining the persecution faced by the Uyghurs and other Muslim Turkic groups and why it can legitimately be described as a genocide. Building on this, through scriptural analysis of the Quran and Sunnah, the paper argues that in the face of such injustice, it is incumbent on every Muslim to change their consumption habits to ensure they are not spending their rizq, i.e. sustenance, on perpetuating the suffering of Uyghurs and other Turkic people. Specifically, I show that social justice is at the heart of the Muslim faith, and that it is contrary to Islamic teachings to appraise the value of social action through its measure of effectiveness in this dunya world alone.
My talk is structured in five parts. First, a brief background is provided to contextualize the conflict in East Turkestan. This includes a socio-demographic description of the region, as well as an outline of the economic, political, and geographic benefits the territory offers. Second, I discuss the evidence of China's treatment of the Uyghurs and other Muslim Turkic people. Third, I explain why that treatment can indeed be qualified as genocide. Fourth, I highlight the centrality of social justice in Islam and how this core tenet enjoys on Muslim an obligation to ensure their actions are geared towards alleviating injustice and abstaining from perpetuating the suffering of others, including through their consumption choices. Finally, before concluding, some practical actions we can all take right now to alleviate the suffering are presented. On to our first section. In the 19th century, the Qing dynasty conquered East Turkestan and renamed it Xinjiang, which translates as new territory or new frontier. However, East Turkestan remains the preferred name among the region's Turkic inhabitants, and thus is the term adopted in this paper. It was only in 1949, under Mao Zedong, after short-lived bouts of independence, that the People's Republic of China officially annexed East Turkestan and it has been officially known as Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region since 1955. Therefore, much like the Palestinians since 1948, the East Turkic people have been under occupation since 1949. This is an important historical fact because it undermines China's narrative that Uyghurs are simply a quote-unquote Muslim minority in Chinese territory. They are an occupied group. Uyghurs are not the only people who live in East Turkestan, so let's look a look at the region's demographic breakdown. East Turkestan boasts an ethnically diverse population, constituted of 13 ethnic groups, of which the Uyghurs, Hans, which are the Chinese majority ethnic group, and Kazakhs are the largest in number. Kuei, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, Tatars, and Tajiks comprise some of the smaller populations. According to official Chinese data, which are disputed by the World Uyghur Congress, of the 22 million population in 2010, approximately 10 million are Uyghur, 8.8 .8 are Han Chinese, 1.4 are Kazakh, and 1 million are Kuwait. Turkic people identify as Central Asian, and are both culturally and religiously closer to other Central Asian ethnic groups than to Han Chinese. Their language is more similar to Turkish than it is to Mandarin, and the large majority of Turkic people identify as Muslim, in stark contrast to the majority of Chinese people who have no religious affiliation. The next section outlines the strategic advantages driving Beijing's appetite for hegemony over East Turkestan. I won't go into detail here given the time constraint, but I invite you to read the paper for further information. There are several reasons why China benefits from maintaining control over East Turkestan. First, it's an area that is rich in natural resources. The region boasts, quote, the largest reserves of oil, natural gas and coal, end quote, in China, representing 30%. 34% and 40% of the country's total, respectively. In 2019, East Turkestan also accounted for a fifth of the world's cotton and 85% of China's total production. That's 85%. Second, East Turkestan also offers Beijing sizable landmass, making it, quote, a major area for raising sheep and cattle and fine wool production, end quote at three times the size of France. For the most populous country on earth, the region offers important food security advantages. Third, its geographic location offers important trade links with Asia and Europe, vital for the success of China's gargantuan Belt and Road Initiative. Announced by Xi Jinping in 2013, 
This initiative seeks to revive the Silk Road trade network and vastly expands China's economic and political influence on the world stage. The strategy plans to cover two thirds of the world's population and account for a third of global GDP. To achieve its objective, China plans to build six economic corridors, which you can see on the slide. And East Turkestan plays a vital role in the success of three of these. And these are the new Eurasian land bridge economic corridor, the China Central Asia, West Asia economic corridor, sorry, the China pa and the Bangladesh China Myanmar economic corridor. Having set the scene, let's look at the evidence of China's treatment of the Uyghurs and other Turkic people. It is estimated that Chinese authorities have detained over a million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in internment camps. Distinguishing between those imprisoned and those who are attending part-time so-called reeducation programs, a more accurate estimate puts the number of interned people at 1.5 million in 2019. And I invite you to consult a paper by Patrick Dehan, which was published in 2019, who goes into detail in terms how that we got that number of 1.5 million. An official 137 page leaked Chinese government document, so an official document that was leaked known as the Caracas list, shows that they are detained and interned for so-called crimes, which include having, quote, worn a veil many years ago, end quote, having grown, quote, a long beard years ago, end quote, because, quote, wife wore a veil, end quote, having relatives abroad, or for, quote, having applied for a passport that never left. Another reason is simply for being categorized as, quote, unquote, untrustworthy. Adrian Zenz defines the latter as, quote, a general category of suspicion that is hard to grasp. It represents persons whom the state feels cannot be easily as understood or controlled as it wants them to be, end quote. Other signs taken of so-called religious extremism in the literature include, quote, praying regularly, inviting too many people to one's wedding, reciting an Islamic verse at a funeral, washing bodies according to Islamic custom, teaching the Qur'an to one's children, asking an imam to name one's children, attending the mosque regularly, studying or teaching quote-unquote unauthorized forms of Islam, praying at a mosque other than on a Friday, and making the pilgrimage to Mecca. For the Uyghurs and other Turkic people interned, Evidence shows that the Chinese state has subjected them to forced labor, which multinational companies like Amazon and Apple benefit from. In 2018, 570,000 individuals were also forcibly sent to pick cotton. And I don't need to remind you of the link between the Atlantic slave trade and the cotton industry. There is also substantial evidence of a state campaign to forcibly sterilize women in the most populous Uyghur regions and reports of detained women being, quote, given unknown drugs and injections that cause irregular bleeding and a loss of menstruation cycles, end quote. In addition, there are also charges of, quote, torture and inhumane treatment of detainees, the forced separation of children from their parents, the denial of the right to practice their religion or speak their language, forced organ harvesting, enforced disappearances, and killings in detention. And this is, was by the Bar Human Rights Committee in, in England. More recently, an investigation by the BBC reported that Uyghur detainees is describing quote-unquote systematic rape inside these camps. In a BBC report, Gulzira al Khan tells how she was ordered to, quote, remove their, i.e. Uyghur women's, clothes and handcuffs and handcuffs them to the bed so they cannot move, end quote, so that men could, Han men could rape them. On screen is an account from one of the survivors. They don't only rape, but also bite all over your body. You don't know if they are human or animal. 
They didn't spare any part of the body. They bit everywhere, leaving horrible marks. It was disgusting to look at. I've experienced that three times. And it's not just one person who torments you, not just one predator. Each time there were two or three men. Outside these internment camps, the Muslim majority ethnic minority are under mass surveillance by the Chinese state who use mobile phone apps and AI facial recognition technology developed by startups and multinational companies like Huawei that can track down Turkic people and quote, send an Uyghur alarm to police if it detected a member of the minority group, end quote. This campaign of extreme surveillance and, quote, extrajudicial internment and compulsory indoctrination of Muslims, end quote, has been confirmed by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists after their investigation into classified Chinese documents leaked in November 2019. And these are known as the China Cables. There are a number of official leaks. One of them are the China Cables. The others we will discuss throughout the presentation. The Chinese state's campaign of community-wide surveillance is not limited to public spaces. As part of the state's strategy of what Darren Byler calls terror capitalism in colonized East Turkestan, it has recruited, quote, more than a million Chinese civilians, most members of the Han ethnic majority, to aid the military and police in their campaign by occupying the homes of the region's Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities, end quote. So you essentially have people in Uyghur homes and other Turkic minority homes watching what they do, what they say, what their children say, 24 hours a day. This is what China calls, quote unquote, the Become Family program. And it dates back to 2014 and is supposedly a way to identify, quote unquote, religious extremism, signs of which are whether Uyghurs greet relatives and friends with the popular Muslim greeting, Assalamu alaikum peace be upon you, and whether they have a copy of the Qur'an in their house. Alongside the militarization of East Turkestan, making it, quote, one of the most heavily policed areas in the world, end quote, this campaign of state terror, as Joe Finley puts it, who's at Newcastle University in the UK, is manifested by, quote, what she calls demographic securitization, which is accelerated hand in migration, ethnic displacement, linguistic securitization, which is the imposition of Chinese medium education, and religious securitization, which was the repression of Islamic practice, end quote. I don't have time to expound on each type of these securitizations here, which include extraordinary shifts in the demographic makeup of the region and forcing Muslims to eat pork, sell alcohol, and a ban on fasting Ramadan. But I encourage you to read the paper for all the references, and to consult Joe Finley's work, as I mentioned, the academic at the University of Newcastle in the UK. So how does China explain, if you like, this repression, you might be asking? China justifies its approach in East Turkestan in terms of counter-terrorism and fighting Uyghur separatists particularly in response to the 2009 Urumqi riots. So Urumqi is the capital of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And the 2009 riots left 197 people dead, which Chinese officials list as mostly Han. The Tiananmen Square car attack in October 2013, that left five people dead. The March 24 knife attack that killed 31 people and injured 141 and a knife attack that left eight people dead in February 2017. However, the application of a community-wide punishment enshrined in the state's quote-unquote strike hard against terrorism policy in 2014 make this campaign a racist and Islamophobic government-led effort. And I refer here to recent leakages of the Xinjiang papers. So this is another official leak, which first took place in 2019 and was leaked again only last month in 2021. Well, in September, then was made public 2021 to the Uyghur um, tribunal. And it shows how this repression comes directly 
from Xi Jinping and Chinese leadership. Moreover, I would argue that labeling these acts as violent, labeling Uyghurs as violent separatists conveniently ignores the fact that Uyghurs, like Tibetans, are an occupied people who have sustained decades of violent and repressive campaigns by the Chinese government, trying to forcibly assimilate them and eradicate their ethnic identity, faith, culture, and way of life. Having discussed the evidence of the repression, the question is whether we can qualify this as genocide. Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, i.e. the Genocide Convention, to which China is party, states that genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. That means only one of the following needs to be established, not all commensurate with. Such as killing members of the group, causing seriously bo serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Based on the evidence discussed above, including lead government documents, it is apparent that each of these five conditions is met, and some to a greater extent than others. In fact, in March 2021, so earlier this year, an independent report published by the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy produced by academics and experts in international law, genocide studies, and Chinese ethnic studies concluded, and I quote, the People's Republic of China bears state responsibility for committing genocide against the Uyghurs in breach of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, based on extensive review of the available evidence and application of international law to the evidence of the facts on the ground. But they're not the only ones. The same month, I in March 2021, four barristers at Essex Court Chambers, so a UK-based law barrister chambers, in their legal opinion, written after re receiving instructions from the World Uyghur Congress and Global Legal Action Network, concluded that, and I quote, there is a very credible case that acts carried out by the Chinese government against the Uyghur people in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region amount to crimes against humanity and the crime of genocide, end quote. In response, the Chinese government imposed sanctions on Essex court chambers, despite it not being a law firm and having, quote, no collective or distinct legal identity of any kind, end quote. China has often resorted to intimidation tactics, harassing members of the Uyghur diaspora overseas, and has also sanctioned academics and human rights experts, such as Baroness Kennedy QC and Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, for their work investigating the Uyghur genocide. Only last week, the Independent Uyghur Tribunal, which is presided by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, also concluded that genocide is taking place and you can read their summary judgment online if you just type Uyghur tribunal but again I encourage you to consult the paper for all the references at a state level the American Canadian Lithuanian and Dutch governments have all described the treatment of Uyghurs and other Turkic minorities as genocide Despite the authoritative evidence that Beijing is undertaking a genocidal campaign against Uyghur Muslims and other Turkic people, some have resisted calls to describe what is happening in East Turkestan as a genocide. There are two claims that are made. I will go through each in turn. Broadly speaking, the first argument is that so-called re-education through labor 
is nothing new. Nor is organ harvesting, for example, what happened to the Falun Gong in the 1990s. I don't have time to go into why they are not the same, but please do read the paper for my argument and for all the relevant references. But what I will say here is that such an argument ignores previous efforts by Beijing to subvert any criticism of these past events. For instance, in 2014, after the Spanish High Court issued an arrest warrant for the former Chinese government leaders in their connection with the persecution of Falun Gong members and genocide related to Tibet, China threatened economic repercussions, which led the Spanish government of the day to change the law and, quote, limit the judiciary's powers to investigate human rights abuses in other countries, end quote. That aside, it is worth noting that, in the case of the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim minorities, all the aforementioned state-led coercive tactics are being used simultaneously, making the Uyghur community the target of an extraordinary level of sustained and multifaceted state violence. Another critical feature of the repression experienced by this community, which supports the genocide argument, is Beijing's strategy of demographically engineering Uyghur and other Turkic communities. This is captured by the following. Research by Adrian Zenz shows that the government is, in some areas, targeting to sterilize up to 34% of married Uyghur women of childbearing age. The sterilization campaigns are not only politically, but also financially supported by the state. Quote, for 2020, the Xinjiang Health Commission budget featured another $19.5 million for such sterilization campaigns. Beijing's campaign of mass sterilization is corroborated by leaked government documents. So what I referred to before the Caracas list showing that, quote, violation of birth control policies constituted the most commonly cited reason, quote, for internment. Second, just one year after China launched the, quote, unquote, strike hard against terrorism policy in East Turkestan, the region witnessed an exceptional fall in population growth. Specifically, growth rates fell by 84% and this is a quote from Adrian Zenza's research entitled Sterilization, IUDs and Mandatory Birth Control. He finds that, quote, growth rates fell by 84%, 84% in the largest two Uyghur prefectures between 2015 and 2018. And declined further in several minority regions in 2019. Meanwhile, for 2020, so last year, one Uyghur region set an unprecedented near zero birth rate target, a mere 1.05 per meal, i.e. per thousand, compared to 19.66 per meal in 2018. So in two years, essentially, the birth rate has dropped from about 20 to 1 per thousand. This was intended to be achieved through so-called family planning work. Finally, this same research report that I just quoted you from finds that the proportion of women, quote, aged 18 to 49, who have either widowed or in menopause have more than doubled since the onset of the internment campaign in one particular Uyghur region. Importantly, Adrian Zenz shows how the drive to demographically engineer the landscape in East Turkestan by severely reducing the populations of ethnic minorities and increasing the number of Han Chinese is part of an explicit intention to eradicate or drastically reduce ethnic minority populations. Together, all the above provide convincing evidence that a genocide is taking place. Specifically, it shows a clear strategy intended, as we saw from the definition of the Genocide Convention, to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group 
by, quote, imposing measures intended to prevent birth, end quote, among Uyghurs and other Turkic people in direct contravention of the Genocide Convention. The second claim is that accusations of a genocide are based on falsified evidence manufactured as part of a quote-unquote Western ploy to weaken China. In particular, critics of Adrian Zenz have suggested the allegations of state-mandated birth control of the Uyghur population, which we just discussed, are based on doctored data. These criticisms are then relied upon to ridicule the charge of a genocide and promote the idea and the accusation of Uyghur persecution being but a Western ploy. Given the instrumental role Adrian Zenz's work, which is cited in this paper, has played in bringing about the scale of the abuse in East Turkestan and making the, scale, and making the case for it being labeled a genocide, it is essential to make brief mention of these accusations. Although again, I can't go into the same detail I do in the paper for time constraints, but again, I would invite you to please read the paper for a detailed explanation and all the references. Much of the academic criticism which Chinese state media has gone on to promulgate comes from Ling Fang Fei, associate professor at Xinjiang University. It's easy to get lost in the ad hominem attacks, mainly based on Adrian Zenz's religious affiliation. But for a focused discussion on the substance of the allegations, Zenz provides a comprehensive rebuttal to the accusations of data manipulation made by Fang Fei. And this is a paper entitled, A Response to the Report Compiled by Ling Fang Fei, Associate Professor at Xinjiang and it was published in 2020. And again, if you consult the paper, you'll find all the references. This particular one is reference number 84. To the best of my knowledge, Fang Fei did not follow up with a reply. It's also worth mentioning that where mistakes were made in the initial report, notably the title error on figure six, these are corrected in the subsequent updated March 2021 version. Other Adrian Zen's critics also rely on Fang Fei's work. Moreover, many of the critics' sources for refuting Zen's works center on attacking Zen's person and rely on official Chinese government sources and state-sanctioned news outlet such as Global Times who openly refer to Uyghur activists outside of China as quote-unquote scum. The charge of a Western ploy to destabilize China appears particularly appealing when one considers the fact that Adrian Zenz is a senior fellow at the Victim of Communism Memorial Foundation, and his report highlighting Beijing's campaign of mass sterilization, which we discussed, was published by James Foundation, Jamestown Foundation, both of which are right-wing conservative think tanks with US government links. Similarly, other foundational reports, such as Shu and colleagues and Ruser and colleagues, were published by Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is a think tank which is partly funded by the Australian Department of Defense. The former report was also financially supported by the UK Foreign Office. However, it's important to note that these affiliations and associations are not something any of the report authors try to hide. And the institution's names and funders are clearly evident on the reports for readers to investigate. Indeed, while it would be naive to think that the US would not be advantaged by and actively work towards an economically and politically weakened China, it is a grave intellectual leap to connect dots that are not supported by evidence and descend into conspiratorial thinking. Indeed, to conclude that the persecution of Uyghurs is an anti-Chinese conspiracy, as some would have it, designed by Western powers, would require an ominous alliance between governments and civil societies 
to which academics, politicians, think tanks, the Uyghur diaspora, lawyers, human rights activists, journalists, media outlets from different countries and across multiple continents are all committed. Such dedication to the oath of Amerta is intellectually impossible to entertain by any serious academic, particular in light of the substantive evidence for such a charge. Because to hold on to claim two would be to dismiss, one, the multiplicity of sources used to reach this conclusion, including leaked Chinese government documents, which we discussed the China cables, the Caracas list, the Xinjiang papers. Also, official Chinese government statistical publications, which all these statistics are based on. These are called the Chinese statistical yearbooks. Eyewitness testimony, video evidence from interned Uyghurs, satellite images, testimony from Uyghur diaspora around the world who have undergone harassment and whose family back in East Turkestan have disappeared as well as evidence by a former Chinese police officer who has defected. What is important is that these independent sources have all been found to corroborate each other. Second, it would be to dismiss that Aegean Zens is not the only source of information, but that other academics and bodies have also conducted their own investigations. For example, the China Cables, as in one of the leaked official Chinese government documents, were analyzed by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists who brought together, and I quote, 75 journalists from the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists 17 and 17 media partners in 14 countries to report on the documents and their significance. Other contributors include, but are not limited to, the BBC, independent academics such as David Byler and Stanley Toops, 16 UN independent experts, to be clear, these are not UN staff, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the Uyghur Tribunal, and the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy, whose panel comprised more than 30 experts, including academics and lawyers across different countries. And again, in the paper, you can consult all these references and see each of these organizations or individuals research. But to hold on to claim two would be also to dismiss the fact that when reports first surfaced of the detention camps in China, the country vehemently de denied that such camps existed for months actually. And it was only in light of increasing evidence and global pressure that Beijing finally recognized the camps existed. Thereafter, changing their global strategy to one normalizing the camps as quote unquote vocational training. It would also be to dismiss that through their campaign of mass surveillance, Beijing has a policy of controlling all information coming out of East Turkestan by severely restricting reporting and assigning, and assigning security officials to spy on and tail foreign journalists. It would also be to dismiss China's attempts to shut down any criticism of the situation in East Turkestan by resorting to a campaign of intimidation, harassment and sanctions towards those who highlight their abuses, be they members of the Uyghur community abroad, lawyers, human rights activists or members of parliament in the UK or journalists. More recently, China withheld the release of crucial population data in the latest 2020 Xinjiang statistical yearbook. So these were, this was the source of many of the demographic statistics. And so limiting the release of this information limits vital research into the demographic changes occurring in the region. Adrian Zenz reports that the release includes, quote, no birth rates by region, no ethnic population breakdown, no total population breakdown by region, and no data on birth control, end quote. In sum, there is conclusive evidence that China is committing genocide against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in East Turkestan. 
and any suggestion to the contrary can be soundly refuted. The next section highlights the centrality of social justice in Islam and outlines the obligation on Muslims to reevaluate their consumption habits in light of this suffering. Justice is an integral constituent of Islam, rooted in God's divine nature, as Dr. Nazir Khan puts it. With God described himself as Al Adl, the utterly just, and Al Hakam, the impartial judge. The centrality of social justice is captured in the Quran, where God exhorts the believers to stand firm for justice, even if against themselves. You who believe, uphold justice and bear witness to God, even if it is against yourselves, your parents, or your close relatives. So fundamental is social justice to Islam that in the Hadith Qudsi, recorded in Sahih Muslim, God outlawed oppression upon himself, saying, O oh my servants, I have forbidden oppression for myself and have made it forbidden amongst you, so do not oppress one another. Importantly, the prohibition of oppression in Islam extends not just to human beings, but to all of God's creations, including insects, plants, animals, and the environment. This is lucidly captured in Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, the first Khalifa after the death of the Prophet, alayhi afdal salatu salam, famous command to his army as they set off on a military campaign. He's reported to have said, do not kill women or children or an age infirm person. Do not cut down fruit-bearing trees. Do not destroy an uninhabited place. Do not slaughter sheep or camel except for food. Do not burn bees and do not scatter them. In Sunan Abu Dawood, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, also reproaches a group of companions who burnt an anthill to clear an area to set up camp during an expedition. If Islamic military jurisprudence derived from the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet والسلام, forbid Muslims from, killing, from burning insects, killing animals indiscriminately, and cutting trees even during warfare, what then of the oppression of fellow human beings? In fact, a fundamental act of spiritual salvation in Islam is to free a slave. As God declares in his Quran, what will explain to you what the steep path is, it is to free a slave, to feed at a time of hunger an orphan relative or a poor person in distress, and to be of those who believe and urge one another to steadfastness and compassion. Following this command, while also speaking against the, against the ill treatment of slaves, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, also encouraged his followers to free slaves, be they Muslim or non-Muslim asserting that, quote, he who emancipates a slave, Allah will set free from hell every limb of his or her body for every limb of his or her slave's body. And this is from Sahih Muslim. While the specific form of slavery, God and the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, are exhorted mankind to fight against, have been eradicated, forced Chinese labor camps, as discussed above, are still very much a reality. Through Qiyas analogy, it can be deduced, therefore, that every Muslim is religiously obliged not to contribute to and to take active steps to alleviate the oppression and suffering of interned Uyghurs and other Turkic people, be they Muslim or not. Indeed, when the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, declared, quote, that the person who enslaves a free person would not have their prayer accepted by God, the companions understood this as a universal principle affirming the freedom of all humankind from any kind of exploitation or abuse. This is from research by Dr. Nazir Khan called Islam and, uh, Social, uh, and Social Justice, published by Yaqeen. Again, the reference is in the paper. Indeed, among scholars of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, it is fard a'in, not fard kifaya, to eradicate injustice, meaning that it is an obligation on each and every morally responsible Muslim to eradicate justice. 
So fard kifaya is a collective obligation, which if a small minority of the community does, it absolves the rest. So think of the funeral prayer. And fard ain means that is an individual obligation to eradicate injustice. You can't say, well, a small proportion of the population is, of the community is doing it, and therefore I'm absolved. It is obligatory upon each and every individual morally responsible Muslim. One might agree with the above, but at the same time, not recognize one's personal responsibility in light of this. This is because, like racism, is sometimes erroneously understood only as present when explicit physical or verbal assault takes place, oppression is often only recognized in its extreme forms. That is, as actions that involve a blatant act of violence, torture, and mental and physical aggression, which tyrants and those in power directly inflict on people. But I would argue that framing oppression in this way allows us to distance ourselves from being the oppressor. And Islam does not endorse such simplistic conceptualizations that absolve people from responsibility. Muslims are repeatedly reminded that people will be held to account for all their rizm, i.e. sustenance, they enjoyed throughout their lives. The centrality of ensuring Muslims do not perpetuate evil with the blessings God bestowed upon them is captured in the powerful hadith recorded in Jami'a Tirmidhi where the Prophet ﷺ declares, The feet of the son of Adam shall not move from before, his Lord, from before his Lord on the day of judgment until he is asked about five things. About his wealth, about his life and what he did with it, about his youth or her youth and what he she wore it out in, about his her wealth and how she he earned it and spent it upon, and what she or he did with what he knew, i.e. what did they do with the knowledge that they knew, did they implement it or not? The obligation for Muslims to use their wealth for good and not evil forms the spiritual core of one of the five pillars of Islam, zakat. The latter is the obligation on all Muslims who can afford it to pay two and a half percent of the excess of their excess wealth to the poor and destitute every year while also serving as a mechanism for societal redistribution on a spiritual front, the paying of zakat is a means to purify a Muslim's wealth. It would therefore be paradoxical for a Muslim on the one hand to strive to purify their wealth as ordained by God, but then decide to spend their purified wealth on perpetuating injustice and the misery of others. Indeed, Islam is not a religion that divorces action from spiritual belief. As Muhammad Asad put it in his seminal work, The Road to Mecca, when describing the message of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, Action is part of faith, for God is not merely concerned with a person's belief, but also with his or her doings, especially such doings as affect other people besides oneself. The reality of Islam being a religion of action and standing up to social injustice is perfectly captured in the saying of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Whoever witnesses something evil, let him change it with his hand, and if he is unable, then with his tongue, and if he is unable, then with his heart, but that is the weakest form of faith. In referencing this hadith, Khan explains that, quote, in this sense, Islam does not permit one to be a bystander to any form of injustice. One is morally obligated to do everything in one's power to eradicate oppression. Of course, this duty is accompanied by the requirement for wisdom to ensure that one's attempt to remove an evil does not backfire and lead to a greater evil. The important for Muslims to be vigilant of what they consume and expend their sustenance on is repeated throughout the Quran. One such example is in chapter 90, the city, where in talking about mankind, God says, does he think that no one will have power over him? I have squandered great wealth, he says. Does he think that no one has seen him? This link between consumption and spiritual purity is further captured by this powerful narration in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet 
made mention of a person who travels widely, that means in the cause of God, such as in search of beneficial knowledge, his hair disheveled and covered with dust, i.e. he or she is visibly exhausted, having put effort in striving in the path of God. He or she lifts his hands towards the sky and thus makes, i.e. to make supplication, to make dua, and the dua is, O Lord, O Lord, so crying out to God. Whether his diet is unlawful, his drink is unlawful, his clothes are unlawful, and his nourishment is unlawful. How then can his supplication be accepted? The association between an act of worship as integral as du'a to purity of consumption, even for someone striving in the path of God, is an important reminder when considering our consumption habits and choices in light of the suffering of Uyghurs and other Turkic people in East Turkestan. As a permanent member of the Security Council, China may veto any resolution that seeks to refer the situation in East Turkestan to the International Criminal Court. China has also made a reservation to Article 9 of the Genocide Convention that provides for the referral of any dispute between state parties to the International Court of Justice. In light of Beijing's powerful position with the United Nation and its economic heft, it will be challenging for meaningful, meaningful international steps to be taken to prevent this genocide and force labor from continuing. As such, I argue that individual action centered around making more informed consumption choices presents one of the most important avenues through which to fight against the atrocities being committed against Turkic people and, av and alleviate their suffering. That said, and this is an important point I'd like to stress, it's essential to remember that the effectiveness of actions is not the only prism through which Muslims should assess whether they should act or not. As previously discussed, the importance of acting against oppression is a divine extortion, making it authoritative in and of itself regardless of whether a person thinks their actions will achieve the desired end or not. As such, the defeatist argument that individual action, such as boycotting Chinese products and brands that support and profit from Uyghur misery are futile because they are inconsequential to the behemoth that is the Chinese economy or a company's balance sheets, I argue only serve to justify inaction and the satiation of egocentric material desires. Indeed, taking such a resigned approach is in sharp contrast to Islamic ethos. As the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, declared, if the final hour comes while you have a shoot of plant in your hands and it's possible to plant it before the hour comes, you should plant it. And this is in Albani. That means that even if one knows that the end of times is literally about to occur, a believer should still strive to do what they can to complete a good deed. In saying this, we are reminded of the Quran recurrently stating, so see for example, chapter 53, verse 38 to 42, that actions do not only have a worldly consequence, and if undertaken with the right niyyah, intention, they will be of benefit in the akhirah, in the hereafter. With that in mind, this final section proposes a list of actions individuals can take to play their part in stopping this genocide. While we might not apply them all, that should not stop us from striving to complete as many of them as we can. <clears throat> First, write to your local officials, be they members of parliament or senators, urging them to raise awareness of the situation in East Turkestan, asking them to declare a genocide is taking place, much like Canada, the US, Lithuania, the Netherlands and the UK, and to push for relevant legislation like the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act. This actually only passed again last week by in, in the US. 428 to 21. It still needs to go back to the Senate, but it is a step in the right direction in the US. And essentially, it's an act that stops US companies from profiting from abuse. 
Two, write to your National Olympic Committee, expressing your concern of what is going on to the Turkic people and urging that they boycott the Beijing Winter Games 2022. And we've seen some recent official boycotts by the US, Canada and the UK. To be clear, though, that doesn't mean that athletes aren't going. Three, boycott the Beijing Winter Games 2022 by not tuning in to watch any part of the event. In 1936, Hitler used the Berlin Summer Olympics as a way to promote his Nazi anti-Semitic ideology. We often think we would have stood up for the Jews in Nazi Germany and would have been on the right side of history. In 2022, we'll have an indication to see if that's really what would have been the case. And I'd like to stress here that it's worth noting that Jewish leaders and organizations have used Holocaust Memorial Day to actively raise awareness about the situation in East Turkestan. Four, don't give your money to sponsors or organizers of, of the Beijing Winter Games, who are helping the Chinese government sports wash the genocide. And these include popular brands such as Airbnb, Alliance, Coca-Cola, General Electric, Panasonic, Procter & Gamble, Samsung, Visa, and so on. You can find the full list of sponsors on the link on the screen. And also, if you refer to the paper, there is also a link there. You can also write to them, urging them to reevaluate their support in light of the clear evidence of human rights abuses. Number five, stop financially supporting companies like Huawei, Amazon, and Apple that profit from the exploitation of forced Uyghur labor by refusing to buy their products and use their platforms. For a, fill, for a full list of companies that have been directly linked with the exploitation of forced Uyghur labor, a report in 2020 produced by Shu and colleagues, and which was published by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, lists all 83 foreign and Chinese companies directly or indirectly benefiting from the use of Uyghur workers outside of Xinjiang. So I invite you to consult that report. I won't mention them all here, but these include companies like Adidas, Gap, Asus, Nike, Volkswagen, Zara, and many others. Some of the listed companies in this report have taken remedial steps, for example, H&M, while other companies such as Apple, Nike, and Coca-Cola have actively lobbied to water down the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in the US. So this was the act I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, where it would make it harder for American companies to profit from slave labor. Apple, Nike, and Coca-Cola have ordered lobbies against this bill. So not to stop. Meanwhile, companies like Huawei play an integral role in China's mass surveillance of Uyghurs and other Turkic people. As I mentioned in the, in the paper, they have actually developed what is quote unquote an Uyghur alarm. They're one of the biggest supporters of this AI financial recognition supporting the state to monitor the Uyghurs and undertake mass surveillance. So do your due diligence before you buy and or boycott. Six, don't buy made in China or made in the People's Republic of China. In light of the evidence of a state-sanctioned genocidal campaign against Turkic people, don't buy any goods made in China. The fact it's state-sanctioned, as I mentioned, is corroborated by the Xinjiang leaked official papers that take it all the way to speeches delivered by Xi Jinping. While boycotting China might seem difficult, it's worth noting that there are alternatives available, such as boy buying second-hand clothes online. I appreciate this will change depending on the region you're in, through eBay, for example, or at charity shops. But this is not to suggest that one should only change consumption habits where there are ethical alternatives available. If there aren't any, then not buying a product is always better 
than purchasing a product built on the misery of others. Indeed, it's important for Muslims to think beyond simply halalifying consumption choices within the status quo, particularly one built on, as Darren Byler puts it, terror capitalism and the exploitation of people. Let not a poverty of ambition aiming solely for the satisfaction of material well-being be the overarching purpose of our lives. Seven, check where your mask is made. There have been numerous reports that Chinese companies have exploited forced Uyghur labor to produce personal protective equipment such as face masks during the COVID-19 pandemic and have exported these internationally, including to the US and Europe. Don't holiday in China. Spending time and money in a country involved in a genocide makes you both financially and morally complicit in the subjugation and genocide of the Turkic people. And this includes Umrah and Hajj packages that involve staying at the Hilton, who have a Hilton in spe specifically since they have agreed to build a, a hotel on the site of a bulldozed mosque in the region. This is in the Hotan Prefecture. And it's worth noting that estimates based on satellite imagery shows that since 2017, 65%, so 65% of mosques have, quote, either been destroyed or damaged as a result of government policy. And Hilton is perpetuating that by agreeing to build a, mo a hotel on top of a destroyed mosque. Nine. Always check before you buy that you are not purchasing cotton from China. Look to support companies that are committed to not using cotton from East Turkestan. It is particularly important to financially support such companies, for example, like H&M, as they are facing boycotts in China as a result thereof. So when certain companies like H&M said they would stop using cotton from the region, there was a counter boycott of H&M. Moreover, if your favorite brand is still using such cotton, write to them urging to reevaluate in light of the authoritative evidence that a, giant, that a genocide is taking place. 10. Financially support charities and human rights organizations. If you can, consider offering your sadaqah and donating human rights organizations, supporting persecuted Uyghurs and other Turkic people. For example, you could donate to the World Uyghur Congress, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, the Uyghur Tribunal, which, as I said, has just provided its summary statement only last week, and charities running Uyghur emergency campaigns such as Penny Appeal. There are others, but these are just some of the ones that I listed. Verbalize your support, stay informed, and spread the word. Educate yourself, your family, and your friends, and encourage others to take some of the actions outlined above. Another way is to raise awareness on social media. Follow relevant organizations to stay informed, sign relevant petitions, and show up to demonstrations once COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. The World Uyghur Congress provides a list of petitions on its website, as well as relevant social media hashtags that you can use to maximize your impact. And again, the link, the address is in the paper. This specific one is footnote 128. 12. Write, organize, and volunteer. Riz sustenance is often thought of in terms of wealth, but it encompasses all blessings. So set your intention to use whatever riz you have been given to raise awareness. For example, if you have time, volunteer. Likewise, if you're an academic, then use your God-given intellect to write about the situation in newspapers, blogs, magazines, papers. You can also raise awareness of the situation by organizing seminars and or fundraisers at work, school and university, much like this one. 13. Help Uyghurs and Turkic people reclaim the narrative. With China trying to erase the history of the Turkic people, terminology is important. As such, call the region by how Turkic people self-identify not with their oppressors, not how their oppressor defines them. So it's East Turkestan, or China's occupied East Turkestan, rather than Xinjiang, which, as we said, translates as new territory. As such, don't call Uyghurs and other minority Muslims Turkic groups, such as, quote-unquote, Chinese Muslims. 
As Uyghur activist Aidan Anwar puts it, quote, it's like calling Palestinians Israeli Muslims, end quote. 14. Remember the Uyghurs and Turkic people and all oppressed people in your daily du'as and increasing good actions to become a wali, a friend of Allah, whose du'a is always accepted. For in the Hadith Qudsi, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, declares that God said, my slaves keeps coming coming closer to me through performing nawafil, i.e. praying or doing extra deeds besides what is obligatory, till I love him. And if he or she asks me, I will give him her. However, remember that an accepted dua is associated with inwards as well as outward purity. So sincerity in dua needs to be manifested in our external behavior, including better consumption habits. To summarize, let me borrow from Dr. Nazir Khan's paper, Divine Duty, Islam and Social Justice, which again, you can find a full reference to. The Islamic faith, shared by one quarter of the world's population has a profound tradition of social justice that is rooted in spirituality, seeing humankind as custodians of this world, divinely entrusted with the duty to always stand up on the side of the oppressed and speak truth to power. Through the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, Muslims must seek to revitalize the true essence of the faith which calls upon human beings to serve God by caring for those in need. And in our times, Uyghurs are one of those people who are in need, and one way to care for them is to adopt ethical consumption habits to ensure we are not spending our wealth in companies or organizations that are perpetuating the Uyghur genocide. Wallahu a'lam. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Samir, for your presentation. And I think hearing from you has been an eye-opening experience for me. And I imagine that uh, among other attendees, students attendees too. And thank you very much for providing a, a very in-depth uh, understanding of the economic, uh, political, and social factors that have led to the um, genocide among European Muslims. So thank you so much. And now we will open up the Q&A session. And I saw that we have one interesting question from Mr. Amir Kuti. And uh, for, the, uh, for other participants, feel free to write your questions in the Facebook comment section. And um, I think I will uh, read this question from Mr. Amir Kuti. And, uh, he said that, Assalamualaikum brother, I would like to ask your opinion when the Muslim world isn't saying anything about China's situation and cultural cleansing of its down golden Muslim minority, what should we, the Ummah, do to stand against the call Thank you very much, and thank you for the question. I think that's a, it's a very important one, because one that sometimes comes up often in my discussions when I'm speaking about this. So, what I would say that it is true that I mean, Malaysia stands out, Turkey stands out, Qatar stands out, some of the key countries, Indonesia stand out, some of the key countries have spoken out and not signed certain papers in support uh, of China. But I would be wary of being hasty and running towards this and to suggest that the only reason this is done is only by Muslim majority countries is for purely economic reasons or because of some nefarious attitude. What I would like to do is take a step back and I think about where, how, where this information is coming from. Most of the research and information that we have on genocide in East Turkestan and what is happening to the Uyghurs is from English resources. It's undertaken by Western academics. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what it means is that access to knowledge and access to information, maybe for us, is easy because we're bilingual or trilingual or whatever. But it doesn't necessarily down flow to all other 
populations and other Muslim majority countries. That's not to say it's fine, not at all. What I'm saying is that the argument is quickly is is, is quickly um, taken is that these are done either for hypocritical reasons or for nefarious reasons. What I'm saying is that we should think about this. We should maybe have a more nuanced approach. Think a bit more broadly about where, how, what, who are the gatekeepers of information and the access. So that's one point. Is that research is normally done in English. So it could be that information is not necessarily there. The second point is that there is a reason why certain Muslim majority countries are not just, but developing economies do not necessarily support or are apprehensive of claims made by certain so-called Western powers. And that's just if you look at the history, right? Muslim majority countries have been betrayed historically quite often uh, by the UK, by the US, by France. I mean, there were many are ex-colonies. And the, um, the betrayal has occurred many uh, over many other periods. So I would argue that apprehension of the claims being made is not necessarily illogical. So the steps I would say what we need to take in my humble opinion, is to ensure that information is more widely available to do what we can do, to share, as I mentioned, with our friends, with our colleagues, but also more broadly, because that does not absolve, I want to be clear, I'm not saying this absolves any of the individuals or the state, or, but what I'm saying is that it's not a simple answer in, of why this might be happening. So what we can do is ensure we try and use, as I mentioned, our intellect, our God-given intellect, to share this information with those who don't know, and perhaps those who don't have the same access to information as we do. You know, some people have different levels of education. That might be their strength, so they can analyze more complex information. Other people might be wealthy, so they have more financial power to be able to disseminate information. Everybody has a role to play, and our role is to answer the question, to try and ensure that, the, you know, as, as the question put it, for everybody on the OMA to have access to that information, to know what's going on. Thank you so much, Mr. Samuel, for the very insightful response. I hope that it will answer the question, Mr. Arifiti. It's a very interesting question. Um, for other participants, uh, feel free to write your comments, your feedback, your questions in the Facebook session. One point I think I could just make, perhaps, while, while we wait in the meantime, sorry, is that about this notion of boycott, because one Many times when I speak about or where I've spoken about this, one of the responses is often that uh, it's either too hard or efficacy. So I hope I've addressed the concept of efficacy. But what I would say is that also, in my conversations at least, those who have brought up the concept of efficacy are rarely those who offer an alternative of what to do. So the response is, well, it doesn't have an effect. As I said, I don't. That shouldn't be the prism by which we measure our our acts. But also, beware of those who ridicule or who mock you for taking certain actions, and who don't offer an alternative, or who don't even begin to do something and then try and make it more efficient. And I could go into sort of the pros and cons of, of boycotting, for example, because there are arguments against, which I think can be refuted. Um, but I'll leave that there. Thank you so much, Mr. Safir, for your um, Mr. Samir, for your explanation. And, uh, I think I have one more question about the um, how, as a lecturer, as an academician, and also as a researcher, how can I educate? How can I promote or increase awareness about? making um, informed consumption choice uh, to my students, especially in related to uh, issues of genocide and mass 
Yeah, so that's a, it's a great question in terms of how do we actually move to uh, so more practical steps. So I'm not going to lie, it, 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 it can take quite a bit of effort, to be honest, and time. But and f so to look at where something is made, to look at how where it comes from, can be quote unquote an inconvenience. But we have to look, I think, beyond and install in our families and our homes beyond this notion of gr instant gratification and inconvenience that somehow it's, you know, this is too hard and it's worth it. And I don't mean to, to be crude or to be blunt, but one thing we can always think about, for example, with Coca-Cola, I like Coca-Cola, I don't like Pepsi, I can't give it up. You then have to ask yourself, and all of us do, whether that taste justifies the systematic rape of a sister somewhere in East Turkestan. And that question, that answer can never be yes. So if you're not giving up a product, or, and I, this is a reminder for myself first, cannot give up a product because it's too hard, what you're effectively saying is that it equates with the misery, with the rape, with the murder, with the organ harvesting, with the torture of somebody else. And then we have a bigger problem of what we need to look into. But in terms of how to approach it, I would say we look at where products come from all the time. But our starting point has to be one, not of saying I will look for an alternative to get it, if it exists, but I will only get it if there is an ethical alternative. So it's, if you like, a sort of change in our consumer behavior. Not I want X product, but rather I will only get X product if it's satisfied. And that, as I said, can be frustrating. But it's not as frustrating or as miserable as what is happening to Uyghurs and other Turkic people abroad. And then, as I said, there are other companies. So an alternative to Amazon, for example, might be eBay. There are alternatives. You can buy... You know, there are certain phones, for example, now, which don't have to be the most recent Apple iPhone. There's a more ethical product. It might not be as good, but it will only develop as consumers purchase it more. And these things, to be clear, are sometimes the ethical alternatives is more costly. And that's why I would argue that those who have more privilege, it is incumbent on them to do more. But the higher cost, whether it be in finances or in time, should not prohibit us from making the right choices. I hope that answers your question. If not, I can. Yes, uh, is that, that, that's, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, sharing your response and uh, very thoughtful and very in-depth response. I really appreciate it. And I think we have two more questions, Mr. Samir. Mm -hmm. One from uh, Mr. Pon, and the second is from Notice Tina Mazara. And this is uh, the first question. Uh, what's your perception when Saudi took silent uh, on the EQ issue? Sure. <clears throat> so I think this touches on the first question as well, um, which, which, were, which was asked by, by the brother. So no one is excusing silence, right? But I often find, and I'm not suggesting this by, by, um, by the, the person who's asking the question, but we often, in my conversations over the past few years, it has often been asked to me, what about huge supranational powers? What about massive countries? I'm not clear on what that means of why that takes away our responsibility. So what countries do, we, you can sort of be activism and do something towards that to change the behavior. But let's look at ourselves first in terms of enacting some change. Let's change our consumption habits. Let's be inconvenienced. Let's pay our sadaqahs, you know, frequently elsewhere. Let's spend our weekends helping. You know, when we rectify ourselves first before looking, and again, this isn't to excuse any of the signs, but as I mentioned in my first question, I don't think it's always such a simple a straightforward answer. I think it's quite complex of why these might why these might happen. But other than that, pointing the finger elsewhere, 
I think might be a way, and I'm not again, I'm not suggesting this from from Mr. Bond, but genuinely, in my experience, is to deflect from what we can do. The idea that I hope I have tried to communicate is that it's not just a question of efficacy. It's also an act of worship to know where your money is going and where it's not going. I remember this uh, hadith by Imam Ahmad, rahimullah, where he was in prison. And the guard asks him, am I of the, well, first he asks him, is the, is, 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 is the hadith of the, um, of the oppressor and the oppressed, is it, is it sahih? And Imam Ahmed says, yes. So the guard sort of steps back. I came across this a, a, couple, of, uh, a couple of weeks ago, steps back sort of and says, so am I one who aids the oppressor? Am I the one who aids? And Imam Ahmad rahimullah, says, the one who aids and he gives, you know, is the one who cleans the house, is the one who, uh, is the one who uh, cuts the hair of the, of the, of the tyrant. And, is, and one of the descriptions, so the fourth description is, and it's the one who trades with the oppressor, the tyrant. As for you, you are the oppressor. Now, I just want to focus on that category. It's the one who trades with, right, of what Imam Ahmed is talking about. So let's focus on our individual acts that we can take and think of it simply not beyond efficacy, but also from a spiritual uh, perspective. Thank you so much, Mr. Samir. Um, and I think a uh, question from Nurkis, uh, you already answered the uh, question from Nurkis Tina, the same question from Mr. Arif Kuti and also Mr. Bond. Um, would you like for me to, um, do you want to add anything or do you want me to go to the next question? It's up to you. I, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to go. Maybe I can add, it's, uh, it's quite helpful to see the question. Um, so if you'd like to, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yes, uh, the next question. Add, I will if I don't. Uh, the next question from uh, Nur Kistina Masara is What is your opinion when Muslim countries who know about the new issue and they remain silent and don't do anything? Yeah, and it's, it's clearly, it's, it's clearly, I mean, you can tell by the number of questions and conclusions, it's clearly an issue, right? But um, as I said, you know, Malaysia is a country that stands out as one that has both in Indonesia. Uh, uh, Qatar and Turkey are, are notable exceptions, but we, the only thing I will just I'm add sorry. again is what, what can we do to um, to change it ourselves rather than look, than look abroad? Because if our aim is to change sort of the grand scheme of things, then we that perpetuates inaction. Thank you so much, Mr. Samir. And um, I try to be respectful to your time. I know that yes. I have uh, one hour and a half, uh, one hour and a half uh, presentation, including the Q and A session. And I think we um, over one minute over. And, uh, That's okay. If there's something that is pressing, I'm happy. I'm happy to stay for a couple of minutes. And yes, this is another question from Mr. Bond. If uh, Mr. Risa can highlight the uh, question, thank you. That's quite a yeah. That's quite a loaded question. I'm not a. I know, I'm not an expert on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I think I. I know what um, what many of us uh, probably know. So I didn't know that it was promoted by by Brunei Darul Salam group, to be honest. Um, but uh, the fact that it reached you it, is great. I'm not sure I can comment on that because I'm not an expert in that area. But why we can't? Certainly, economic heft plays a big role. So China's economic heft plays a big role uh, on the global stage, right? So as I mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative is is one example. It's also 
um, debt that it gives to many countries, right? So you have a lot, quite a bit of literature on how, you know, particularly in, 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 on, on the African continent, where the Chinese state operates through um, uh, indenture through debt, which is obviously a much, much more able to do that than, than for example, the uh, smaller Israeli countries, for example. Um, but also, as I mentioned, I think one of the issues is information. Um, I don't think the um, most of the information that we have on the genocide is is in English. Most of the academics are Western academics. So access is one thing. But second, the history, too, that, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a um, I don't think it's illogical for many Muslim majority countries or developing economies, whether it be Latin American, Muslim or not to be uh, wary of uh, Western um, assumptions and claims. History suggests that they have been betrayed systematically, whether you take, you know, if you mentioned Palestine and Israel, we took at Sai Pico, the UK, what it did, what it did to Palestine, what the French did in Algeria, and the list goes on, right? Indonesia, Malaysia. So I don't think it's a simple answer of only economic, economic prowess. But I do think there is there are a number of more complex and nuanced factors driving us. But I hope, and this is one thing that I've tried to get through, uh, and I'm conscious of time, that we are not defeatist or defeated by these types, by the lack of action of others, and that we rely that there is a wisdom by uh, by Jalla Jalalu, by God of why these things happen and what we will answer for is ourselves. I won't answer for Dr. Azhar and Dr. Azhar won't answer for me. So let's focus internally, change what we can do, and then we can look more broadly. But look on also beyond efficacy. But the idea of looking at the sort of grand picture of what other organizations could do, what other countries can do, what other people can do, I think while maybe not intentional, deflects away from what we can do. And I don't think that is the right way to go. Thank you again. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Samir, for a very um, thorough response. It's always we appreciate it so much. And I think to respect uh, the time of, the, of your time, also participants' time, that would be the final question. Mm -hmm. But before we end this session today, uh, I would like to say thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Mr. Samir Weda Metwali, for your very insightful responses to all the questions. And uh, for participants, I hope that you have all enjoyed today's presentation. And again, on behalf of Pemikir and also the UMK Islamic Center, thank you very much for your participation today and take care. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for your time and for all the organizers. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much for being with us today, Mr. Samir. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Salam alaikum.